Singapore, 6.30 p.m. in Thailand, 11.30 a.m. in the UK and 12.30 p.m. in Vienna. I'm Kage of Ethos Books. Picking off new shoots will not stop the spring. Thank you for joining us. My wish is for you to feel, during this launch, the significance of the book. Your attention honours the people who have made it possible. On 1st February 2021, the Myanmar military staged their coup. By 15 February, the editors Brian Hammond and Coco Tet had already reached out to Ethos Books. We took on the responsibility of publishing this title in March. Later in the year, we invited and were joined by ally publishers Ballastier Press and Gaudi Boy. The exceptional power in this book comes from the people whose writings have been compiled and edited by Coco and Brian. Some of them were killed by the junta during anti-coup protests. Their experiences stay with us, and in reading them, we remember their lives. Collective memory is one way to resist the disappearance of lives cancelled by violence. Regardless of borders and nationalities, we can contribute to this collective memory and support the Myanmar people with our awareness and compassion. Our memory of the writers will now be shaped by the form and beauty of the writing in this book. This is an English edition. May we see future editions spring forth in different languages across even more countries. I am grateful for the availability of Nanda one of the contributing writers, Brian and Coco, the editors, our moderator, Daryl Lim, and looking forward to their conversation. May I now introduce Daryl before handing the session into his good hands. Daryl Lim Weijie is a poet, editor, translator, and literary critic from Singapore. His first book of poetry is A Book of Changes. He is the co-editor of Food Republic, the first definitive anthology of literary food writing from Singapore. His latest collection of poetry is Anything But Human. His poems won him the Golden Point Award in English Poetry in 2015, awarded by the National Arts Council Singapore. Over to you, Daryl. Yeah. Okay. So thanks very much uh, for that, uh, I think, wonderful introduction, Akage. Uh, I'm Daryl Lim. I'm a poet from Singapore, as you've heard. And it's my honor today to be moderating this session, uh, the launch of Picking, Up, Picking Off new, sh uh, new Shoots Will Not Stop the Spring. I think a vital and landmark apology of, uh, po of poetry and writing from Myanmar slash Burma. Um, and I think an urgently needed one. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll first in introduce the three panelists I, I have here today, uh, Coco, uh, Brian, and Nanda. And then we'll launch into a, into a discussion for about 45 minutes or so um, around some questions that, that I've prepared and sort of posed to them. And then we'll see how that conversation goes. And uh, we'll leave the last 15 minutes or so uh, to, um, to, to take questions from the audience. Uh, and hopefully many of you will have very interesting things to ask uh, about this uh, pivotal anthology. Um, okay, let me start with the, with, with the biographies. Uh, and, I'll introduce the, the two uh, co-editors first. Uh, Coco Tet is a Burma-born poet and literary translator. After a brush with the authorities in the 1996 student pro protest and a brief detention, he left Burma in 1997 and now lives in Norwich, UK. Thet has published several collections of poetry in both Burmese and English, and his translation work has been recognized with an English pen award. Brian Harmon is a, re is a researcher and lecturer in the Department of English and American Studies at the University of Vienna. A book, art, and music critic, he writes, he writes widely on contemporary culture from Asia. Writer and contributor Nanda is a feminist advocate, a storyteller, and a podcaster from Shan State, Myanmar. She is the founder and executive director at Purple Feminist School and host at Jitor Zega Wine, sorry, uh, uh, please pardon my, my Burmese pronunciation. Um, Jitor Zega Wine and Feminist Talks and was one of the 100 inspiring and influential women from around the world uh, for, to, for 2020. Uh, so 
maybe I can start off with just a few words about, about the book and kind of, uh, in some ways, my own relationship uh, to this anthology. Um, so when I was first asked by Ethos to moderate this launch, I very gladly did so, and I received the, the, the volume in PDF first. Uh, and I read it in a single s- sitting, because this is not the kind of gripping book that you uh, will read in a single sitting because of the stories there and just how haunting and evocative uh, the volume is. Uh, and so I sat with it for a while and I was reminded, and Coco will know a little bit about this, uh, of the first time I met uh, uh, Han Lin, because Han Lin, uh, who is one of the Burmese poets uh, in the volume, um, and he's and his, one of his poems be read by Coco later today, uh, uh, tonight. I met Han Lin for the first time uh, in because he came from the Singapore Writers Festival and I said, I was sitting right next to him. And it was also uh, pretty horrendous to find out during the events of, 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 of the past year or so, that he was that he, that he had been arrested um, because of his uh, anti coup activities. And I'm, I'm glad. I think now I think he seems to have been out. Uh, but it, it really brought, brought it home so real to me that this man was sitting right next to me, and whose poetry I actually really liked because <laughs> I think he's a fantastic poet. Uh, was suddenly uh, uh, his life was in, was in danger, uh, and so I think for many of us, the events of the region may seem distant. Many comfortable Singaporeans in their homes, where everything is going well. Uh, but actually, it's really not too far away. Uh, and uh, the cries and, and, and the struggles of, of, of the Burmese people have touched a lot of our hearts and impacted us deeply. And so I, I thank again the editors and the contributors for this important volume uh, and the uh, publishers, the three publishers for bringing up these voices. Um, okay, so maybe let, let's jump to the, to, the, to the discussion proper. And I'll sort of open this question first to, to the editors, Coco and Brian. Uh, and it's, it's really a very simple question is, uh, how did the anthology come about? And could you tell us a little bit more about how you put it together? Um, and maybe some of the questions that, I, that, I, that immediately came to me was, you know, because both of you were, come from outside Myanmar, you're not, you're not based there anymore. So what was the process of uh, corresponding with the wider community? How challenging was it to put together and get a sense of what was happening, especially if people were being detained or, or, or even killed uh, tragically? So maybe I'll leave it there, uh, ask you to tell me how, how, how that process went. Yeah, per- perhaps I can start with the, the first part of the question and then Coco can pick up uh, the, the second part with communicating and, and getting in touch with the various writers. Um, Coco and I were first in touch a number of years ago. I'm, I'm also the editor of uh, the Shanghai Literary Review. And there was a book that came out, I think it was published in... Um, I think it was published in originally in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, and then translated and published into English in 2017. And that, that book is called Hidden Words, Hidden Worlds, Contemporary Short Stories from Myanmar. And this was a, um, a five-year project that was put together by the, the British Council. Um, and it basically, uh, it's collected writing by uh, writers from ethnic backgrounds across Myanmar. Um, and it was, it, was a, it was quite an interesting multilingual creative writing project. And um, I contact, contacted Coco uh, because I thought he would be, he would be um, an excellent candidate for reviewing the book and he kindly agreed to review it. Um, and so that was that's sort of how I first, uh, Coco, well, that's how we both came to know each other. Uh, it was through that, through that review process. Um, and then shortly after uh, the events uh, started to unfold in Myanmar, um, we both got in touch with each other and, and we, we felt this sort of deeply, deeply felt need to try and do something about what was happening there and trying to preserve the writing that was, that was, um, that was proliferating um, online primarily. Uh, and one of the things that we wanted to do was to really, in a certain sense, Try and archive that writing. Try and try and really preserve that writing, um, rather than have it sort of disappear into into this this digital world. Um, and so we started to gather the writing uh, by reaching out to the various writers, and um, and then it became it became unfortunately as the the violence started to intensify on the part of the military, it became. Uh, it became an elegy. It became many things. It became an elegy to to a number of poets who who tragically lost their lives, who were murdered by the military, um, and it also it also became a platform as well for for these writers uh, within the country. And I think I'll I'll sort of let Coco continue on uh, describing that whole process. 
Yes, uh, in the beginning, it was about uh, preserving resistance writing that came out of Burma, you know, usually they are on social media and diaspora journalists like Momaka. We were thinking of that. In the beginning, Brian did a lot of groundwork too. I mean, calling, uh, inviting uh, uh, contributors and so on, he, because he is on social media and I'm not. So I got to uh, thank Brian for that, uh, for doing that groundwork for this. And later, of course, after my friends Kathy and Kiza Win were murdered by, you know, Kathy was murdered in May, Kiza Win in March. So our resolve strengthened, and and uh, I decided, uh, we decided to make it kind of a mausoleum. Uh, this book, as you said, and uh, and Nanda, uh, we found her when she published an article that we uh, in, in uh, Index on Censorship. So we invited her as well. So, but in, in the very beginning, it was mainly through the, the contribut contributors from, you know, contributors who were associated with Pan Myanmar that we, we got so many uh, uh, contributions uh, via Pan Myanmar, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I think that that's that. It's always fascinating to know how these things come about. I think, and because I think so much of the of the events of what happened unfolded online as well in terms of the writing. I think that's that's one very interesting aspect of this uh, anthology. Maybe I invite Nanda to say a little bit about how how you felt when you were asked to contribute uh, uh, to the anthology and sort of give a bit of uh, reflections about the process. Well, honor was the first word that came to my mind, but I also thought it was such a uh, needed work to be done, you know, because so many like Pokota and Brian mentioned that so many of young people are resisting through online, through their writings, and through their arts and um, only very little time where we see all of their works collectively in one place, you know, and that collective, this book is not just a, a book, you know, it's a collective strength and a collect collective resilience that Myanmar people have brought in this revolution and still carrying on. So it was, um, I feel really honored to be a part of this, but also at the same time, I think uh, one of the really, really great thing about this collection I see is that the diversity of the voices of all, all, all the young people and also older generation who have uh, gone through a coup more than one time, you know, and uh, young people also uh, diversity in ethnic city as well. Like, you know, there were Kachin people, Shan people and Nepali, like you would not have seen Nepali people contributed in the past in like, you know, book like this in the, uh, in the past. So that was something I was really also very impressed by the book that Kogota and Raya were able to kind of bring so many diverse boys in one place that has one main goal to achieve democracy and to uh, continue resisting the coup. Thanks very much, Nanda. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a great point. And actually we'll come to the bit about the diversity and the sort of time period a bit later, but I'm glad you brought it up now. Um, but maybe one question that I have since we're talking about time and history is actually, uh, I was just thinking about this today because I saw another news article about the ongoing sort of uh, ASEAN engagement uh, 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 with the regime. And in some ways, of course, the events are, are over, but also not over because no nothing's been resolved. So I guess one question that I had immediately was why come up with this volume at this point in time? Um, and, why, and why not? I mean, like, why not wait till later? Why not? Uh, yeah. So, so maybe you can give us a bit of uh, insight into your thinking about the timing of this volume. Uh, if um, yes, I think this moment or this movement is not just you know we are seeing right now and we felt very immediacy of the moment as well as a movement uh, in 2021 that that is that is a main major uh, major impetus behind our our uh, anthology. But then when you think of Burma, Myanmar, the coup started in 1962, and only in 2010 that we had some hint or some kind of democracy, democratic transition. So 
by 2020, it was ended. So from 2010 to 2020 was, I think, the most significant uh, phase in recent Burmese history. So I, I thought that that's why we, we would have to uh, document what's going on right now and you know sooner than later. Also, of course, there's also availability of writings and works that was not known before because, because of the online environment. Yes. Mm. Thank you, Coco. I think that that's a great point. Brian, do you have anything to add at this point in terms of the timing? Um, I think I think in many respects the the decision was made for us because of the the extent to which uh, there was this outpouring of of writing um, and and I think if if we think of ourselves as all implicated subjects uh, it's 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 really difficult to look away um, and so it's it's something that we were confronted with and I think just because of because of you know because of a shared sense of solidarity and humanity and so on um, that we we felt that we had to we had to do something to try and try and um, I don't want to use the word help because it's it's a bit it's a bit inadequate but but to try and try and do something about the situation whatever that whatever that actually turns out to be yeah okay I, I think to, to maybe to summarize is, is the, the urgency of the situation and just the, the energy of it was in some ways so overwhelming that, that the book would have come out in some form, right? It, it's sort of, it's, it's so, uh, it's so it's such an outpouring. And I think we really feel that as we read the book because, and, and, and the way it's structured. I think maybe now is a good time to uh, do some reading <laughs> from the anthology. I remember I invite Coco to read uh, poems from two contributors. Uh, Coco, take it away. Well, I think uh, I would suggest Brian to read this ah. poem by Ngaba, which is, you know, which which is a proper beginning. It's a it's spring by Ngaba. Yeah. By okay. the way, Ngaba is a very well-known poet. You might have, uh, Daril, you might have already seen him, uh, but uh, he, he doesn't want to use his real name. So Ngaba is a pseudonym. Um, yeah, so the, the poem is called Spring. Um, it's obviously... Um, metaphorically appropriate, but also seasonally appropriate as well. Um, and uh, it's a spring, seized, turned into swallows. Swallows, caged, turned into clamors. Clamors, silenced, turned into scenery. Scenery, covered up, turned into eyes. Eyes, forced shut, turned into dreams. Dreams, denied, turned into maps. Maps, destroyed, turned into memories. Memories, deleted, turned into roads. Roads, blockaded, turned into ancillary legs. Legs, smashed, turned into wings. Wings, clipped, turned into breeze. Breeze, detained, turned into storm. Storm, imprisoned, spawned a million offspring. Those offspring, are our in-breath and out-breath, swallows in and out of our nostrils, our spring. Fantastic poem, <laughs> really quite fantastic. Uh, Coco, you want to read the poems as well? I think maybe we can just take them together. Yes, yes. And, and the spring uh, by Ngaba is actually uh, very relevant because it's, it describes how, you know, protests were shaped by formed by in, in response to violent repressions. So we, ha we have had several types of protests. Uh, so many ways and forms of you know, protests uh, in Burma in 2021. So it's about how the spring was unstoppable and you know, how uh, yeah. the manifestations of protests came about due to the violent uh, repression, repression, yeah. And that's it. And then I'm going to read a poem in Burmese uh, first uh, by, of course, Han Lin, one of my favorite uh, poets. And uh, uh, the poem is called Elevator, and he wrote it around 2015 or 14, I think. And uh, it's a short poem. Uh, Han Lin, Elevator. The coffin doesn't fit in the elevator. Let's keep it vertical. The body will be standing. 
isn't a coffin always too heavy? Shall we put this one on wheels? A coffin pusher wandered in an elevator, going down in a high rise. Uh, thus in, in English, and may I read in Burmese as well? Um, Please. Hanlin, Delhi ga. A kongu, Delhi ga de, lia like tami yalu, don't like taja yaro me. A longa, matta chila me. Tevo shrivu, a keke shilalu, a kongu, rinda pulu la de. Rinda kongu, don yaro me. A kong tundu lu la de. Mien be, that jida dai tema, Delhi ga de zin, sin la ni de. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akoko. Ah, beautiful. And actually, um, incidentally, this is a, this is not a very relation reflection, but I thought it, it struck me when I read Hanlin's poem. Uh, there is a play. There's a Singaporean playwright who wrote a play about the coffin is too big for the hole. Uh, in similar ways, it, it reminds this poem reminds me of it, and it actually talks about. It also made fun of the state, uh, thing, and kind of like the, the 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 rules of the state, and I see a similar spirit in Hanlin's uh, poem. Uh, okay, I, I I now want to move on to another question, and I, this was the second question. So I, I actually just pose these questions because they actually came to me as I read the book. The second question that came to me, and it's quite obvious immediately in the title of the book, is that although I think some of the the publicity about the book talks about the events of last year. And, and, and sort of the, the more immediate coup. Uh, actually, it's from 1988, and it traces all the way back to the uh, 888 uprising. And so actually, it then hints, and as you read the book, it, it excavates a much longer history of, uh, I would say, protest poetry, political poetry in uh, Myanmar. Um, and that, that, I think, is one of the most fascinating and the most uh, rewarding uh, aspects of the book. And so maybe I, 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 I want to ask about the choice of uh, why, why this book uh, curates such a long history. Uh, so that's one question. And then also uh, why there's this tradition of political poetry in Myanmar. Maybe Koko, Brian, and Nanda can all sort of comment a little bit about it. And maybe related to this question is, in some ways, I suppose, then, is it right to say that history in Myanmar in, 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 uh, that history in Burma is never just history. And it's, in fact, all of it is still quite live. And, and I say this because it was interesting to me. And the one particular example that I thought to highlight was that there's, you know, Ko, Ko Min Lu's poem. And Ko Min Lu's poem was actually like, a, it's a really old poem, right? It's like from 1989 or uh, 1988. And yet, because of the events of, 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 of 2021, it became live again. And so in some ways, the, the past and the present are so intermingled that that it just recurs. It's like a nightmare. It's like a recurring nightmare, right? So I wanted to comment, ask you all to comment on this historical aspect and the tradition of political poetry in, in Myanmar. And uh, anyone can, can, can start. Yes. Um, I've been saying that, you know, protest poetry or resistance poetry, at least in the Burmese language, the poetry, because we have so many languages in Burma, right? But I'm, I can only speak for the majority Burmese language unfortunately, and uh, the Burmese language, the poetry, resistance poetry, protest poetry written in the Burmese language was contingent upon colonialism. Before, you know, colonialist times, we didn't have any, not even political poetry in Burma because poetry was usually sponsored by the palace and written by monks and other elite uh, types of poets. So only after Burma was occupied uh, or annexed into British India in 1885, there was an upsurge and outpouring of protest poems. Uh, some of them were written by monks. So that tradition, I think, continued to this day. And of course, uh, many poets were not just poets, they were not just armchair um, um poets, they were at the forefront of the anti-colonialist nationalist movements like the King Guru of Mai, who was, uh, who is considered probably uh, the most revered, you know, uh, nationalist poet in Burma, Myanmar. So he was 
also a leader, a nationalist leader, although he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, he didn't take up arms or he, he wasn't uh, into armed struggle. He was, you know, he was a very peaceful poet. Uh, there was Tagodaya also who was uh, a leader uh, in the social realist movement and the 1962 uh, regime and so on. So the poets have always been there. And 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 the poets of Burma, like Kethi and Kizawin, they were very much influenced by those nationalist and anti anti uh, military poets. Yeah. Thanks very much, Koko. Uh, Brian or Nanda, do you want to add on to that? Um, I mean, if if I could, if I could maybe just ask Nanda a question uh, about yeah. about how how you see your work within this within this longer uh, tradition of, of Burmese writing. Um. Sure. I think I did mention this in my writing as well, you know, before the coup. Um, so just, I think first I'll answer Dylan a question about the history stuff. Like, mm -hmm. it's so true that it's like the history repeated. It was like a deja vu when the coup happened, like, you know, and it's like history repeated itself and we, the older gen generation specifically felt like they are relieving uh, the pain and the suffering that they have uh, lived through, you know, and it was um, a nightmare, like I described in the writing as well. And with the work, um, with the work that we have been doing collectively, feminist work that we've been doing in Myanmar, what I can say is that like Kuku, uh, Kuku mentioned earlier about since 2010, there were kind of a, um, significant changes that we were starting to see, you know, um, in terms of legality, it was a very, very slow progress, I agree, but it was going somewhere, you know, like, just look at one example about how um, 10 years ago when rape happened or um, harassment happened, it would not be some, it would not have been something that people could go to the court and complain about it or have a case on it, you know. But now, because of this kind of um, dialogue that we've been kind of um, um, having over the past 10, 15 years, it was going somewhere. And it was opening up to people's mind to have that dialogue on, around human rights. You know, I grew up not knowing I have human rights. Like, believe it or not, I grew up in a small uh, village in Shan State. And I thought that the only way to live our life is to, through traditional values, you know, and that is the, and, and because, and this is a very kind of deliberate systemic work of military, like making people think that you don't have rights and what they decide and what they do is the only way of um, making this country safe and better and like, you know, protect you sort of thing. And the only way that I learned the real history that we are talking and the human rights was when I came outside Myanmar to, to educate myself, you know, to study. And it, I'm just one in a million example. So there's so many people like us that were, living in a very dark um, knowledge that they don't have rights, you know, but slowly that was changing because of the help of the internet of kind of, you know, spreading information, but as well as because of the work of a lot of poet and like, you know, artists and um, educators and um, change law change maker, that's the, all these people who played important role in bringing changes um, were kind of, evaporate, you know, suddenly because this coup happened. And like you said, um, it's it's like we are back to 1963 or something like that again. So it's very painful to watch and go through this again. Yeah. I think, I think to jump off that, I think a lot of the pain of course also comes in very real terms because many people have died uh, and many of the poets here are no longer with us. And that's why I made the comment to, to, to everyone by email that in some ways the book feels like a mausoleum um, uh, to the dead. Uh, and maybe I can get, uh, I thought this was a good opportunity for Coco to read the other poem uh, um, by Lugale. Uh, I think you're muted, Coco. Coco, you are, you are muted. Coco. Ah, yes. Uh, D. Lugale, 
is a Rakhine poet, and he was, uh, and still, I think, uh, he was very active uh, in the civil society and a brilliant poet as well. And you can see it from his uh, poem. D. Lugale, death is not the end. A bird just died mid-flight. Is Johnny half done and now in mid-air? It has taken the last breath. The remaining journey for the lifeless bird is the distance between earth and heaven. The bird is done with dying, but not flying. On earth, however, death usually means the end. Then again, there's exception. Uh, that's a poem without a full stop, <laughs> because <laughs> death is not the end. And uh, uh, I'll read it in Amese. Di Lugale. Fe pile ma pira. Nga ha, yan yin te duare. Tu ye ma te gen lirin shigere, no son ki zin ha. Tian ni yin tan lan, ki te wane yap yi. Lire ma. ตุอัตตะมะชีเบเสยะเรคีกะก้องเงินเนี่ยมีเปญจาอกวาอวีโกตวายะเรเนี่ยหามะโลยะมะชองนาสุตะโลเตซุนโลปีติตันยองคีท
yeah, the ordinary people. Yeah. Thank you very much, Coco. Does anyone want to add to that point? Uh, I, I do know we are a bit constrained by time because uh, we probably should get to Nanda's reading as well. But Nanda, did you want to add, add something? Yeah, I think uh, similar to Kota about dead, you know, and a lot of the time when we say dead, we think of um, like actual dying. But I think just uh, the coup staging, um, um, the, the, the junta staging the coup is kind of... Um, it's killing all of us, you know, like not having hope, not not being able to do what you are um, passionate to do, things like that. A lot of things that have been taken away from us is also a way of killing us. And, you know, I believe that all of us who don't want the coup are dead inside because our hope has been taken away. And, you know, the only reason people, like I say this a lot of the time, the only reason that um, to keep our hope alive was to collectively go outside and like be there for each other and stand up for what we believe. That is the only thing that they cannot take away from us. The rest they have taken away from us. So in some way, all of us are dead, you know, like be, Coco being there when his friends are dying, it's also a way of killing Coco, you know, even though he's alive and safe in, in the UK. So same with me, my family are still in Myanmar and there's mm. so many things that I keep worrying and like, waking up in the middle of the night, like, you know, uh, worrying that something might happen to them because this village is burned, that village is burned. So I think in some way we are really facing the dead. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's that, that's definitely true on some level. But I thought, and um, this maybe is a way to for Nanda to read your piece as well. That although there are many dead and although many things have died, even in that in that in, through through the ashes, you are going to see new shoots uh, spring up, and that is the that is the title of the anthology. And I think Nanda, your work is a lot about new shoots <laughs> and about making things grow. Uh, so maybe you can read a, from from your excerpt, and we can go into questions about that as well. Okay, sure. Um, the title is called A Nightmare That You Can't Wake Up From. Uh, on 1st February, I woke up with no cell signal and quickly realized that something terrible had happened. I looked out into the street and saw many people were running and panic buying. I needed some confirmation that what I thought happened had happened. I could not check the internet or call anyone to ask. I kept looking outside to get an answer and saw military trucks playing the national anthem loudly and proudly to declare their success. I felt devastated, angry, sad, helpless, and hopeless, and I froze. Those feelings are complex and hard to process even today. From that day, curfews were set, uh, curfews were announced, fears were reinstalled, connections were cut, lives were lost and hope was diminished. That day can be marked as the beginning of living with the familiar fear with which our parents had lived. As a feminist advocate who has been walking in advancing the women's right movement for years, it felt like the progress that we had made collectively had just evaporated. I felt extremely unmotivated to do any work. It felt pointless and meaningless to be doing anything about gender equity if the dictators are going to um, rule the country. And realistically speaking, if we continue doing it inside Myanmar, our lives will be taken away. So I paused all the work that I was doing, producing the podcast, creating content and providing trainings. I started joining the protest every day to show solidarity and because it was the only way to fuel our hope by showing up to the protest, by standing up for each other, by rejecting the coup. We hope that we'll one day get what we deserve, justice and equality. Being disconnected from the world overnight is such a scary thing, especially when you have been connected for so long. The experience of living under the coup is like a nightmare that you can't wake up from. It's like a storm that never stops. It's like an earthquake that destroys everything. I returned to Rangoon from Shan to work on relocating outside of Myanmar. On my way back, the highway roads were filled with 
the police and the military intimidating civilians. Are you joining the civil disobedience movement? Are you doing anything illegal? With what was what was more startling for me was to witness the sad, quiet, and damaged Rangoon. Rangoon used to be a lively, fun, extremely busy city, especially at night. But now I see very few people walking outside. Even in the daytime, there were no loudspeakers, no, there was no music, there were no busyness, no smiling, no crying, just complete darkness of quiet with lost lives and unheard voices. Following the coup, Myanmar has become a country that is hard to recognize as it used to be. Peaceful, lively, yet complex, hardworking, and beautiful. We have lost more than a thousand lives, and there has that there has been immeasurable suffering, yet we don't give up. The people who give up, the, who gave their lives for this aren't simply numbers. Their lost lives will become scratches on the wall as proof that we fought and we're still fighting back. The scratches will keep us alive and will keep our voice and us alive even if we die. Yeah, that was it. Thank you for the fantastic reading, uh, Ananda. And actually, that, that leads me to quite naturally to the question because you mentioned in that, even in the excerpt that you read, that you've been involved in, in, in the work of women's rights for quite some time now. And one observation that I had of the mythology and maybe the events in, in, in Burma was that a lot of the prominent poets uh, are male, but actually, increasingly, women are playing a, a more prominent role in the events that have been happening and maybe in Burmese society in general, they've been playing a more prominent role. And of course, the most prominent of them uh, to our minds is of course, uh, is would, would, would be Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, and maybe my, the question to Nanda that I want to pose is what, what role have women played in the most recent events of 2021 and the subsequent response and how has that changed uh, across the years? Yeah, actually, I would like to point out by, you know, starting by saying that I think women has always been a part of any revolution that Myanmar has. And the only thing that is different um, back then and now is that the media has been more um, drawn into telling women's story. And because they have been kind of, because I think I would say, because again, it's a, because of the feminist movement globally that has kind of paying attention to women's contribution um, nowadays you know and back then as well women were playing a vital role like and also the understanding of women contribution is also changing like back then domestic work and like childbearing thing were like uh, things that women are supposed to do and they don't have an option to say no but nowadays because of the economic independency and like financial independency women can say no to this thing at least some women you know and because of that reason now i think uh, me Media and also like people in general are seeing the value that women put in other aspects of life as well. So, and of course, in terms of number, it has increased, for example, women who joined to uh, PDF and stuff like that would not have happened in the past. But now, because women are able to make their own choices, that they are able to uh, make a decision on whether or not they want to participate. Back then, they were not allowed to make those decisions. It was the men who make those decisions for women, you know? And one example about back then and now is like, politically, men were more involved and men would kind of like, like right now, many people run away and hide from the uh, regime. And when they were doing, mostly men were running, women are left behind with their children. And they are the one who were, I would say, building the country, you know, continue living and continue. Um, they are the one, they are the one who were keeping people alive, like keeping children alive, feeding them, taking them to school, doing those kind of important job. And now it's the also the participation of women is more diverse. They they can they don't have to just do one thing of sitting home and taking care of the children while the husband is hiding away or running to uh, abroad, you know, because of the military. Now they can choose which part of this revolution that they want to play 
like whether being at, in joining the PDF or writing or, and their potential is also uh, increasingly recognized by the media and people are deliberately making gender aware decision. And I think that because that changed, now the role of women uh, is also kind of seen as value by the, uh, by the, by the world. And now it's, um, I think that's why it's noticed, but women were always part of revolution in Myanmar. I wanna kind of strongly say that. And that is not, I feel like that is not really recognized time to time. People think that it's just now women are suddenly kind of becoming a part of revolution. That is not true. Women who have always been a part of uh, revolution and changes in Myanmar, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that very illuminating response. I think maybe I'll, I'll pause a little bit here, see if Coco or Brian wants to pick up on that point. Um, otherwise, we will sort of slowly move into the quick, so quite a few of the questions that we've been getting. Uh, but Coco, Brian, anything you want to add uh, to that? On the, if not, uh, maybe I can ask one question, which is actually my last question, but it resonates with uh, a question that one of, the, um, one of the, our viewers is asking is, and it's simply what new shoots do you hope will spring from this project? And uh, maybe it's the same question to all of you. What 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 hope do you have? What hopes do you have for Burma right now? And what hopes do you have for this uh, this book? Brian? Uh, yes. Coco? Uh, Coco, yeah. Coco, no, yeah. Brian, yeah. Uh, Brian. Okay. Uh, can't can't hear Brian. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, if I could just underscore one additional point, um, just picking up what, on what Nandara is saying, has well said. Um, not only have obviously women be, always been a part of revolution, but they've all, always suffered the consequences of revolution. And I think um, there's there's some tremendous reporting being done, um, for example, by Emily Fishbein, who um, who's in the region and who who uh, was also uh, invaluable in terms of helping us get in touch with a lot of uh, writers and so on. And she's been doing some really, uh, really stellar reporting on the, on the, on the impacts of war uh, for women in particular. Uh, and she, she had a piece that I think it was in Al Jazeera that, uh, that discussed the, uh, the difficulties of childbirth, for example, um, and having to flee into, into the jungles, having to Having to having to essentially give birth under or during um, during this conflict uh, and the tremendous difficulties and the tremendous dangers uh, that women have to face in order to in order to endure that. Um, so I think that's the other that's the sort of flip side of of, of this as well. Um, and and it's because of it's because of the the, the courageous reporting um, uh, by people like Emily and others, obviously, um, that we're we're becoming aware of of, of these conditions and, and the things that that women have to endure uh, because of essentially because of men with guns who who uh, overthrew the government um, and and are trying to impose their will through violence. Thanks for that. Um, yes, if that, I. Um, Yes, yes, if I may add to that point, I, uh, one of the you know, explanations of women empowerment, uh, for, for instance, in countries like Finland, which is considered to be one of the advanced countries when it comes to women empowerment, is that so many young men died during the Second World War. They, they died fighting against the Stalinist Russia in the Second World War. And in the domestic area, women remained and they continue to build the country. So that's, I think, one hope that we could have, you know, in, in this scenario where many young men, yeah, for, for women, uh, at least in, in this dark time that, that I could see that women will be more empowered uh, through their struggle. And yeah, yeah, that's one of the hopes I would say, yeah. Yes. No, that, that's very rich discussion there about the role of women. And I think it has a lot of nuance to kind of the picture that, that has been forming. Um, maybe let's go to the questions uh, since we have about, let's say, 10 minutes more to the thing. The top voted question is, uh, and I guess what it's really asking is, 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 what are the challenges and risk of making the liberal translation of this anthology? I'm not sure if, if Coco and Brian would agree that this was a liberal translation, but maybe I can just ask you to comment on on the aspect of translation, 
uh, and, and and how challenging it was or what difficulties you faced or, or issues you had to sort of uh, uh, sort out in, in the manner of translation? Um, well, we, we, uh, we put out a call for submissions. So uh, those poems and essays that were submitted in Burmese, of course, uh, the, the writers and essays, they knew that I would translate them. So uh, it's not liberal translation, but I try to be uh, as loyal as possible. And when possible, I consult with the writers like Spring by Ngaba, I know the poet. So I consult, I show the, you know, my translation. And then, yeah. So that's how it worked. Yeah, not, not quite liberal. I would say I would, uh, and then poets like Kathy and Giza Win, I have trans, I've been translating them before 2021. So many of the translations they, they have read and they knew. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's how it worked. And then, uh, and then we should know that there are several other essays and poems written in English, like Nanda who wrote in English. Uh, so they are like at least five or 10 uh, five to ten pieces of poems and essays. Yeah, they are they are written in English. Yeah, so not all of them are translations. Yeah. Yep. Thank you very much, Coco. Brian, you made that on point of translation, or um, that's 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 pretty much. No, I, I think uh, I mean Coco was was obviously uh, the, the the point person with the translation, um, and I and I believe his his um, his wife did a number of translations as well. Um, but mm. uh, there were the obvious logistical issues too with getting in touch with some of the writers uh, under the circumstances. Um, so that that sort of complicated things to a certain extent. Um, I see. Okay. Maybe I can ask a related question that's also come up in the uh, in the comments is uh, how did you all come to have the book entirely in English, uh, and what was the sort of thinking behind that decision? And I assume that question is why not uh, in Burmese as well. Hmm. That is the uh, the publisher's decision. Actually, we wanted to make make it bi bilingual, but then you know the to make it bilingual, it wouldn't have been possible for us to get the book out in within a year of the coup. It's hmm. a nightmare because I I know I, I have done a bilingual, bilingual anthology of Burmese poetry and it's really difficult, especially with the uh, with the printer and publisher that's not familiar with the Burmese text. So a lot of uh, extra work, but then now we are thinking of a a Burmese only anthology. We would have to then request those who who write in English to retranslate them their essays and poems into Burmese. Yeah, like Nanda. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So as I hear that, it's mostly a it's quite a it's a logistical or, or, or publishing arrangement kind of. Yes, yes. So as a tokenistic measure, we, we, we put the handwriting of the handwritings of some of the writers, like Kathy's handwriting, Minlu's handwriting, you know, just to honor the Burmese script mm. and their original yeah, handwritings. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Brian, anything to add on the point? Or Nanda even? Uh, on the... No? Okay. I, I guess a related question was that uh, which has come up as well. And again, that points to, because we have poems and we have nonfiction, is why there was no fiction in the anthology. Um, was this a conscious decision? And maybe you can give us a bit more insight as to why there's no fiction, uh, there's no, uh, there are no works of fiction, prose, uh, in this anthology. Mm. Uh we decided on poems and essays, but then in the, the initial thinking was that we wanted to document, you know, the protest movement, writing facts and accounts of the protest. So it has to be from out of the protest. That was, that was the beginning uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the anthology. So poems and, and facts and accounts out of the protests. So that's how it was conceived. And then we continued it that way. No, Fiction, but then some of the stories are stranger than fictions, like like my story by Ninja Khan, who you know who had to flee for her life. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I I, I think meaning that both uh, you wanted quite 
at least the starting of this anthology was rooted in personal experience of, of the yes, events. Yes, exactly. The protest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. There's a question for the publisher, which is the next top voted question. Maybe Ka- Kage can try and answer it when he comes on. So, I'll, I'll, and maybe Kage can prepare for this. Uh, and the question is about what challenges did the publisher face uh, coordinating with other publishers and making the ebook available for free? Uh, but maybe I put it here as well. If you if if there's anything that Brian or, or um, Coco want to add at this point, but otherwise, uh, Kage can maybe try to address it when he comes out at the end. Um, there's one maybe one other question, and uh, this one is quite relevant because in some ways, this book is a is a call to of attention to the events in Burma, and uh, and our, uh, our and and the questioner asks, uh, how can the rest of the world best support the creative minds from Burma? Yeah. So, how, how can the rest of the world support uh, the creative or uh, minds or artists, writers in uh, Burma? Maybe Brian. Um, I mean, you know, um, in the first instance, by by supporting the book, by buying the book, uh, by distributing the book, by sharing the book, by posting about the book, by reading these poems, getting to know these writers, getting to know their works, uh, talking about it. Um, I think that's the first sort of immediate step. And I think this circles back to the question of why we did it in English. Um, We wanted to have a a much wider um, audience. We wanted to really draw attention to what's happening within the country um, amongst those outside of the country, because the people within Myanmar know what's happening. Um, They experience this on a daily basis. Uh, Those outside the country obviously have a very small window into it through things like the media, um, but it's important to have the voices of the people uh, within Myanmar um, amplified and and to to have those voices spread. Um, so supporting the book, I think, would be one thing, and I think uh, Coco and Nandar would be in a, a much better position to talk about the various cultural um, organizations or initiatives within Myanmar that, mm-hmm. that people could support. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, I think I feel like you know one of the greatest disservice that we could do to to a situation or to to um, to a problem is by not trying to understanding it and jumping into conclusion and making assumption. So I think the great like the greatest support would be the first step to understanding the situation. Like I see a lot of people on Twitter, especially people who are not from Burma, making assumption and judgment and conclusion and like misleading the conversation from uh, to the point to like other things that are not necessarily important to discuss at this point, you know? And I think that that can be a great disservice. So I think the first thing that people, oh, if people want to support is first to know and understand what the problem is and understanding how exactly you can support without being uh, supporting from colonial mindset like thinking that you're superior and like you know approaching to the problem like I think the best way to support someone is through humanity having a human mind to other person and like um, I, I don't know those are the two basic thing I think no matter how you are supporting whether you are supporting financially or by um, giving you a service or any other aspect I think those are the two basic thing that one need to know before actually helping out that you're helping other person with dignity you know not like or you pity them and like oh I feel sorry for you sort of way. And the other is understanding the situation or like Brian said about understanding these writers who are going through these things. So th- this gives the situation a human story, you know, and it makes people better understand about it through people's land and through, through people's life. So I would say those two things. Kota, do you wanna add? Uh, yes, I think um, it's really important to uh to let you know the protagonists or the people speak and that's what i think we try to achieve with this book uh, i mean albeit a uh, translation right uh we 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 really wanted to uh we really wanted those who who were out of the protest to speak yeah 
for themselves. And yeah, and they were able to do that. Yeah, uh, it's not us. And in the beginning of, of the project, uh, we decided against ownership as well. We don't own this, not financially, you know, or nothing. And we don't, we cannot do it for profit and it will be morally, morally wrong to, to claim ownership for this book. So, so we were very grateful to Ethos as well to make it a pro bono project and sell the book just to cover the cost. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think I think that's a good note to end on because and to invite Kage to come on because I think uh, what is really imperative now is for people to read the book <laughs> and to hear the voices for yourselves. Uh, so please do that. It is, I believe, a free ebook uh, on Ethos. And uh, Kage can tell us a little bit more about the book. <laughs> yeah. As I'm responding to the questions relevant to the publishing house, uh, I would first like to thank the four of you because you have given us a very honest, intelligent and very deeply moving conversation. I find it very deeply moving because, um, you know, there are so many points of connection you have made in your discussion. Yeah, and you have reduced the distance between earth and heaven and also between life and death. Uh, the dates speak to us through the writing. And actually their suffering, I feel, makes us more alive to the freedoms that must be protected. So thank you so much for bringing all this out. And I think the answer to one of the questions about translation and whether uh, we should have done it bilingual, I think Coco, thank you for already sharing a bit about that. It also ties into the democratic vision that I believe is at the heart of this project. This project must not stay in Myanmar, it must go out to the world. Ethos Books is hopeless at Myanmar language, I'm afraid, but we believe that the English will be important. And that's why our ally publishers, right, Gaudi Boy and Ballastia Press, by working with them, we can now bring it to the US with Gaudi Boy and the UK with Ballastia Press. Those are printed books that have power because when you hold something it is concrete it's like the pots and pans that people bang however humble the object i think those are the things that matter it's a very powerful very stirring vision and sound that i totally feel very proud of to be part of my team will say that and daryl thank you so much you are now part of this team so i think the second question is really about um the logistical problems that come about working with different publishers. These are challenges really that we want to overcome because it's like a democratic raft. The powers that be are really mammoth and monolithic. We need to band up and raft together just like the ally publishers with just two more, we speak so much louder. So I think this collection, I'm so happy that, you know, when I ever we hear from Coco and Brian, we know that their heart and their spirits are in the right place. They value the voices. It's never about who owns it. And that's why right from the beginning, we knew that we have to make available for free the ebook. So go ahead to download it from Ethos Web Store. If you want to support the publishers who have committed to this vision, you can buy from the US website Gaudi Boy. So uh, we want to be environmental. Order from the place nearest to you. Order from the UK, uh, like a uh, press, uh, uh, Ballastia Press, they, are, they have a production in the UK. And if you're in Singapore and the region, you can order from our web store. So uh, maybe I also like to uh, end on a very positive note about how your voice and your action can help to spread the word and voices of our poets, our writers. Uh, the Projector, which is an independent cinema in Singapore, they have uh, collaborated with uh, us to make available a documentary titled Paduak Myanmar Spring. It documents the lives of the protesters and human rights activists in Myanmar after the military coup. You can look at their stirring documentary on the projector's video on demand platform. And I think I would like to end my closing note by asking that we continue to remember 
the voices and the poems and the writings uh, together with our wonderful editors, contributor and moderator. Yeah, that's all I have to say for tonight. Uh, Daryl, do you want to close the session? Yeah. No, uh, I think all that remains is to thank everyone who's joined us uh, online. Uh, spend this uh, hour with us. I hope you found it as uh, engaging and as interesting as I have, because I've certainly learned a lot more uh, uh, through this session, even as the moderator. And please go out, please download the book, please buy the book, uh, and uh, amplify these voices in whatever way you find best fitting. Thank you very much, and have a good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.